Welcome to Mr. Biz Radio, biz talk for biz owners. If you're ready to stop faking the funk and take your business onward and upward, this show is for you. And now, here's Mr. Biz, Ken Wentworth. Welcome to another episode of Mr. Biz Radio with me, Mr. Biz, Ken Wentworth. We're going to talk about something that we, um, you know, I think over the seven plus years we've been on the show, we've, we've kicked around this topic here and there, but we've never, we haven't delved into it for quite some time. And we have uh, our guest this week uh, is the author of a book called Be Human, Lead Human. And so we're going to talk a lot about leading uh, in the new world of work, right? Things have changed so drastically, um, especially since COVID. And, you know, people were slow to come back to work. And then I've heard all these instances of folks, you know, uh, companies forcing them to come back into the office full time. And people got used to being home and got comfortable with that. And so then you got... Some companies that are kind of going half and half and some are saying, hey, you either come in the office 100% or you don't have a job anymore, like all these different things, whole new world of work, right? And so I want to talk through some of those things, but how to lead from that, right? It's so different. You know, you think about even just, you know, uh, pre-COVID, you know, back to 2000, you know, 20, 19, 18, how you led in that environment where you had maybe your team was there with you in your office every day. Um, and how things are so different. Things are, you know, a lot of things are virtual and, and Zooms and things like that. So I wanted to have our guest this week on to talk through some of those things because I think it's it's the new world we're living in. And I, I can't see that it's going to change. I think it only continues to evolve and grow from there. So our guest this week is Dr. Jennifer Nash. She's a leading consultant and executive advisor who helps leaders and organizations prioritize people to power performance. Select clients include Google, Ford, ExxonMobil, JP Morgan, my former alumni, um, IBM, Boeing Company, Deloitte, and Verizon. Dr. Nash is founder and CEO of Jennifer Nash Coaching and Consulting, a global leadership advisory and consulting firm that connects people and performance to deliver exceptional results. She was invited to join Marshall Goldsmith's 100 Coaches organization as one of the world's top executive coaches. Jennifer is the author of the 2023 award-winning book, Be Human, Lead Human, How to Connect People and Performance. Dr. Nash, welcome to Mr. Biz Radio. Thank you, Mr. Riz. I'm so excited to be here today. Yeah, so we talked, gosh, what was it? It was probably a couple of months ago now. And so I've been looking forward to having you on the show and, um, you know, kind of getting into this. Before before we can start to dive into all those different things, though, tell us a little bit about your, your entrepreneurial journey, if you would, Dr. Nash. Sure. So, you know, I started out in, in the corporate world and I spent about 25 years there um, working in industry and professional services. And I just celebrated my six-year anniversary of my entrepreneurial journey, um, having started in 2018. So very excited about that and very grateful. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It sounds like uh, we had a similar path. So I worked in the corporate world at JP Morgan for, uh, let's just call it 20 plus years, Dr. Nash. Okay. You can see the gray hair. We don't need to go into details. Okay. (laughs) Um, And I left there in 2015. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I've been, yeah, I've been out uh, almost nine years now. So similar, similar timing. And it sounds like uh, what led you to kind of leave the corporate world and kind of go out and do your own thing? You know, I just, I really felt like I was at a point in my career where I needed to grow and evolve outside of what I was able to do in the corporate box. And so I felt like it was the right time for me to take all the skills and experiences that I had had over that 25 year career um, and launch my own consulting company and do the work that I love most and help clients grow and evolve and reach their potential. So I think we're living in a parallel universe somehow, Dr. Nash, because that sounds exactly (laughs) like when I'm on shows and people ask me that question, pretty much my answer as well. I'd always (laughs) want to do my own thing. And I just, you know, my corporate career went really well, fortunately. Mm-hmm. And then I got into doing a lot of really cool stuff. And then finally, I just, it was odd. And I, I'm, so I'm curious of what your exit like. So my exit was, I just had reached, you know, a point where I'm like, this is it. This is time. I don't know what it was. It was like some <laughs> grand, it wasn't like some grand epiphany. It wasn't like I got super mad or, you know, whatever. It was just like, okay, it's time. I'm going to do it. And I didn't even know what I was going to do next. And so I'm like, I'll figure it out. Right. I know I'm going to do something entrepreneurially. Um, and I was getting promoted and all this other stuff. And so I'm like, yeah, I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to leave. And my boss is like, what the heck? So what was your experience like leaving the corporate world and, and, and branching out on your own? 
oh, you know, there were so many different emotions and so many different conflicting thoughts in the, and during that period of time, because for me, like coming from, you know, my, my family was very conservative and very risk averse. And so yeah. to them, you know, throwing away essentially the, the position and the job and the company I had, you know, aspired to work for, for the, my entire career and finally getting that didn't make a whole lot of sense, you know? And so there was a little bit of resistance there. There was some pushback there. Um, and for me at the same time, you know, I had to get very comfortable with, you know, where is that safety versus risk line? And up until that point in my life, I had really been playing on that safety part of the line. And so, you know, shifting that mindset from a W2 type of role into an entrepreneur type of role, unless you've done it, there's really no preparing you for it. And it was a tough decision. I'll be honest. I mean, it probably took me, I would say about nine months, you know, to really, oh, really? make a decision. Okay. And then from the point that I made it, I knew exactly what I was going to do. But from the point that I made it, it was then executing that that was hard, you know, having the hard conversations with people. And, um, you know, when when you don't necessarily meet their expectations that they had of you because you're you're choosing to leave, you know, those are tough conversations. Um, but I think ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, I needed to do what was right for me and my potential um, and and serve the world in the way that I felt was going to work best for me. Yeah, it's interesting. You want to talk about uh, a funny conversation. So I called my wife. Uh, I was, you know, I was with JP Morgan and I just found out I was getting promoted to, to I was in the top 3%. I was getting promoted to top 1%. And I get to the airport. My wife's like, oh my gosh, this is great and everything. And I said, I'm going to leave. And my <laughs> wife, and my wife said, she said, oh, your, your plane's taken off. You have to go. And I'm like, no, I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to resign. And she's, yeah. and literally there's this long pause, Dr. Nash. And she goes, when did you get to the airport? Have you been drinking? <laughs> I said, no, I haven't. And she said, right. why don't you take a little nap, a little snooze on your plane ride home? And we'll talk yeah. about when you get home. Yeah. Um, and she knew that I wanted to do something different, but I think to her, it was just so abrupt, you know, right. like what happened? What caused this? I'm like, I've, you know, I've always wanted to do this and it just feels like this is the right time. I don't know what the epiphany was. There was not like a, a moment of, of all things. It was, mm -hmm. I'm getting promoted this promotion that into the top 1% at a fortune 15 company. It's like, yeah you know, you really, everyone wants that. Why would you now right. say it's time to leave? And I'm like, because right. now I'm getting further pigeonholed, right? There exactly. are expectations that come with that promotion yes. and relocation. And I was, you know, I'm based in Columbus, Ohio. And right. I, I told my boss, I said, so I assume that I'm going to need to probably move to either New York or London within two to three years. And he said, yeah, absolutely. That is going to be the expectation. I said, I, that's not in the cards for me. You know, I've got kids. I don't want to uproot my kids. And Right. And all that. So it was it was kind of an ironic situation. Uh, and it was, I guess, in some ways to some people, it seemed maybe a little bit abrupt. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just had reached the point. And it's like, I always want to do my own thing. And, uh, you know, it just ironically enough was when I'm getting this, you know, career changing, you know, promotion that uh, I'm like, okay, I got to go because now getting that was going to take me just too far over. Right. It's like almost right. the, the point of no return, almost kind of thing. It's like, no, no, no I don't want to do that. Like it's now's the time. Um, right. And again, my wife was like, Mrs. Biz was like, I, I don't know much about, she's a nurse. She's like, I don't know much about the corporate yeah. world, but yeah, I know you wanted to do your own thing. And if this is, I trust you, you'll figure it out. Right. So um, we got to hit a break here. We're talking with Dr. Jennifer Nash. We're going to hit the break. We're going to come back, give the Mr. Biz tip of the week. We'll continue, easy for me to say, talking to Dr. Nash. And uh, we're going to dive into her book, Be Human, Lead Human, in the next segment. If you would like to reach hundreds of thousands of business owners every week, Mr. Biz Radio can help. Our show airs globally seven days a week for more than 25 hours across several internet radio stations plus 20 plus podcast platforms. Also, video exposure on the new exclusive Mr. Biz Network streaming channel, which gets blasted to 100 plus streaming platforms and the Mr. Biz YouTube channel and our 350,000 social media followers multiple times every week. Join Mr. Biz Nation as an advertiser by emailing us at info at MrBizSolutions.com. Attention, Mr. Biz Nation. We have an exclusive offer just for you. Get lifetime access to scarcity countdown timers and logic links for only $69. Yes, you heard it right, only $69. 
These tools will add urgency to your email campaigns and website pages, helping you increase conversions, sales, and capture more leads. Don't miss this incredible opportunity. Visit GetPulseTools.com now and take your business to new heights. Got a question for Mr. Biz you want answered on air? Email it to info at MrBizSolutions.com. Now, once again, here's Mr. Biz. All right, welcome back to the show. It's time for the Mr. Biz Tip of the Week. And uh, this, one's, this one's a little bit, I don't want to say it's harsh, but um, one of the quickest ways to having financial problems is holding on to unprofitable customers. You have to find and eliminate them. Now, I know most of you say, why would I have an unprofitable customer? I call it the silent business killer. Most businesses don't even realize that they have unprofitable customers. Um, of course, you wouldn't purposely have an unprofitable customer, but oftentimes what happens is you have them and you don't even realize it. And the, re the way it just, I call it the silent business killer because it just absolutely crushes your business because if you have a product or service that's priced unprofitably, you're probably going to sell a lot of it, right? Because it's probably priced under market versus competitors, things like that. You're going to sell the heck out of it. Well, each one, each time you sell that, you're losing money. And so your revenue is going up and your net income is going down. You're like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense, right? Shouldn't they go up together? That's a silent business killer. But you have to find those unprofitable customers. You have to get rid of them. Either raise your prices and maybe they leave you and that's okay if they do. Or you just have to say, I can't do business with you anymore. I can't do it profitably. Um, very, very, very important to the long-term uh, financial success of your company. All right, this week we're talking to Dr. Jennifer Nash. Um, I, we'll put her website, drjenniferNash.com. We'll put all this in the show notes, but you can also follow her on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, so Dr. Nash, let's talk about um, your book, Be Human, Lead Human. Um, what led you to to write that book? What, what, I'm there, I'm, was there an epiphany that you're like, man, I got to get this, I got to get this into a book? You're, you're on mute. You're muted. There we go. Okay. I see your lips well, moving. I'm not hearing yeah. anything. <laughs> right. So there were a couple of things that led to me writing the book. Um, first and foremost, you know, I found that a lot of things that my coaching clients were asking me over and over again in different ways. And I felt like I could put all of that into one place and help a lot of people at once because I can't coach everyone. Sure. So I felt like this was a way that I could reach a lot more people and help a lot more people in their leadership capabilities. Um, secondly, you know, I was working um, in my career for about 16 years before I actually had a leader who helped me feel that I mattered and that I was valued and that the work that I did was important. And it was more than just the work. You know, it was me as a whole human being and the talents and skills that I was bringing, you know, to that organization. So I really wondered why there weren't more leaders like that, you know? And so that was sort of the catalyst for me to, you know, go back and pursue my MBA, um, go back and pursue my PhD, and really dig into why aren't there more outstanding leaders that help people feel that they matter, you know, in the workplace. Um, and that was the second reason. Yeah. So um, how much of your corporate career sort of shaped that? It sounds like that was sort of a, a bit of an epiphany for you in your corporate career. Did that yeah. kind of lead you down the path to where to where you're at now? Um, you know, so the 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 experience that I had, and I tell the story in the book in the introduction about the leader um, that I had that helped me have that epiphany. You know, that was the catalyst. You know, I was I was um, um, you know I created an appreciation moment for that person, and they took the time to acknowledge that basically, um, and it really just struck me. You know, it really struck me at an emotional level that you know, they're the CEO of this company, yet they took the time to acknowledge me, you know, this people leader far down the ladder that they never even met. And I, in that moment, I knew that I was still going to stay like in the corporate world, you know, but I'd always had this question mark in the back of my mind, you know, what if I went out on my own and did this in a way that I feel works best for clients and also when it works best for me. And oh, by the way, it also helps me grow and evolve, right? Because I felt like being in that box, it was not helping me grow and evolve in the way that I needed to. Um, and so, yeah, I think it did actually, um, in some ways, lead me to what I'm doing now. Um, but there was always that that feeling in the background that I, I 
from a very early age too, I was always an entrepreneur, you know, I was selling, um, you know, lemonade stand, you know, as a Girl Scout, I'd go to the door selling cookies. Um, you know, I had, I made pin cushions and I sold pin cushions on the side of the road to people coming home from work. And, you know, so I always had that little entrepreneurial spirit in me. Um, and now that I'm in that space, you know, I, I, I found that this is, this works well for me, you know, from a way that I work, it's the autonomy that I need. Um, and like you mentioned earlier, right with your tip of the day, um, it's really important to work with clients that you feel, you know, are a good fit and a good match for you as well as you're a good fit and a good match for them. Yeah. I think that's, oh man, it's critically important. I, I know when I first left the corporate world and I was, I would take any client, let's just give me anybody, right. I'm, I'm replacing a bunch of, of, of income, like yes. give me clients, give me clients. And I learned very quickly, like that was not fulfilling and I wasn't probably serving them in the best way either. And it wasn't as fulfilling for me. And then once I sort of made that shift to where I don't, I don't work with everyone. Like I have to have a good vibe. I have to feel good about what they're doing in certain businesses I won't work with, or if I meet someone, I just don't get a good vibe from them. Or I think they're, I mean, frankly, if I think they're kind of shady, like I don't, I just don't want to work with people like that. Like it's, right. you know, and I don't have to now. And, exactly. and, and the funny part, and the funny part, Dr. Nash is, and I've told this story on the show, you know, a, a few times over the years is in the corporate world, you know, there was always, it seemed someone that was a pain in the butt to work with, but you had to, you had to make it work because you, in, your, your position interacted with them in some way. And so you just had to kind of make it work. And I had gotten into that, I had that mindset when I first became an entrepreneur and I had a client that was just very troublesome, let's call it. And I got home one night and I was complaining to my wife and I said, man, I just, I, you know, I leave these board meetings and it just drives me nuts. And she said, then don't work with them. And I was like, oh my gosh, she, you're a genius. You're a genius. Like, cause in my, in my corporate career, it's like, well, you, that's not an option. You just have to figure it out. Right. Well, no, I don't, if I don't, if someone I don't want to work with, I don't have to work with them. Right. Like, oh my gosh, what an epiphany. Right. right. Um, but yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. So what led you to writing the book? I have to ask that because I had never, I, I don't even like writing. I'll be honest with you. I've written three books. I don't even like writing. I never planned on writing a book and it just kind of happened. Um, what, what, what led you, had you, had you planned on this or did it just kind of happen organically? How'd that all come about? So I wrote a dissertation, you know, for my, my PhD work. Um, yep. I thought that, you know, writing a book, well, you know, probably be pretty similar, right? Um, no, it's a completely different animal. Um, and I will say like, I struggled for a couple of years trying to just figure out like, how do I write this book? Because there's so much that I wanted to put in it. So a part of it was, you know, the scope, right? What do I put in? What do I leave out? Mm -hmm. And then how do I organize it in a way that is accessible to people? It doesn't read like an academic dissertation, right? And, it, and it's something that is pragmatic that people can actually read it and apply it right away at work, right? That was very important to me. And so I also wanted it to be a book that you could pick up and you could just pick any chapter if you wanted to read it. You didn't have to read from cover to cover, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I felt like writing this book was the next step for me in helping me grow as a person, um, but also grow my business. You know, I use it as a marketing tool for my business mm -hmm. um, and the writing process. It was tough. Like every single word in that book is written by me by hand. There is no AI generated in that book at all. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of work. And so, you know, once I partnered with um, a company that helped me get like my, my thoughts aligned, right? I ended up having like, you know, four rough drafts of the book. There's so much stuff left on the cutting room floor, um, but they helped me get my thoughts and everything concise into the book so that it, it made sense and it flowed, you know, from a logic perspective. And once I had that outline in place, you know, then it was just a question of like banging out the content and getting the chapter material in there. Yep. Yep. Good stuff. Talking with Dr. Jennifer Nash this week, we're going to hit a break here. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about how to lead for the new world of work. How would you like to have direct access to Mr. Biz to help you run your business more profitably and more efficiently? At MrBizSolutions.com, you get live access to not only Mr. Biz, but also several of his hand-picked and trusted business experts, each with 20-plus years of experience to help you optimally manage and grow your business. That's just the start of where Mr. Biz Solutions begins. Learn more at MrBizSolutions.com. 
That's MrBizSolutions.com. Attention, Mr. Biz Nation. We have an exclusive offer just for you. Get lifetime access to scarcity countdown timers and logic links for only $69. Yes, you heard it right. Only $69. These tools will add urgency to your email campaigns and website pages, helping you increase conversions, sales, and capture more leads. Don't miss this incredible opportunity. Visit GetPulseTools.com now and take your business to new heights. Check out all three of Mr. Biz's best-selling books at MrBizBooks.com. Now, once again, here's Mr. Biz. All right, welcome back to the show. Again, we're talking this week with Dr. Jennifer Nash. You can find out more. And again, we'll put this all in the show notes, but DrJenniferNash.com. Um, she's out on Dr. Jennifer Nash on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, and again, we'll put all that stuff in the show notes as well. But um, so Dr. Nash, I wanted to talk a little bit um, in this last segment we have with you about, you know, th so many things have changed so much in the last, you know, three years-ish, uh, four years. I don't know. I guess, I guess it's been, yeah, it's been about four years. It doesn't seem like it. Time flies when you're having fun or not having fun. I'm not sure. Uh, COVID and all that in the post-COVID world. Right. But, you know, how to help leaders, you know, kind of rethink, um, you know, how they're practicing leadership in this new world of work that we're in now. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, COVID had so many negative consequences, but I think there were some silver linings that came out of COVID as well. And one of those things is this realization that, you know, we are operating in a new world of work today. It is not the same as it was during COVID. And it's definitely not the same as it was prior to COVID. We are never going back to what it was prior to COVID. And I think there's a lot of leaders who still want to go back and that tension and that dissonance is creating a lot of problems in the workplace today. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think there are, you know, there's too many, I say too many people, but there are a lot of folks that are the old guard holding on to, this is the way we did things in 2018, right? Well, newsflash, it's 2024. Uh, we got to kind of continue to move forward. Um, and so many things have changed, um, you know. I, I I was always on the opinion when all these things that change that happened with COVID, I think a lot of those things were probably going to happen as a natural evolution. I think COVID just accelerated them massively, accelerated. Right? I think we would have gotten to more of this remote work and things like that. I think without COVID, it probably would have taken another six, seven, eight years before we got to that point. Whereas COVID just forced it. You know, right now, you can't come in the office anymore. You got to stay home. Holy crap! How do I figure this out? And the technology and Oh my gosh, Zoom. I've never heard of Zoom before. Like, you know, I gotta, all my meetings are on Zoom. Like, how the heck do we do this? Um, and so, you know, that the leadership dynamics of, you know, I was out of the corporate world at that point. And, you know, even in the corporate world, I had a little bit of experience with that because I had I had teams in six or seven different cities and different continents and all this kind of stuff. And so I had a, a video conference machine in my office that I could, you know, uh, basically like a Zoom, but it wasn't Zoom. Uh, with folks all over the world and, and meet with them. But um, I think a lot of people weren't used to that. And, you know, you're meeting with the people right next to you. And if you weren't, you're on the phone with them. The, the video conferencing stuff was, um, at least when I left the corporate world in 2015, was still relatively new, wasn't used prevalently. And it's all of a sudden, you know, COVID hits and it's like, this is what you got, whether you like it or not. How does that change? And how does that, you know, really alter the face of leadership? Mm -hmm. You know, I think the ways in which we work today are are different than what they were before, right? So we have all these different tools, these hybrid tools that help us um, conduct meetings, that help us have conversations, um, that help us check in with our people. And I think one of the things that we need to remember is that it's it is even though that the technology is there to bring us closer together, um, in some ways, the screen still divides us right? There's a big difference between you and I meeting in person versus you and I talking over a Zoom call. You know, there's a different energy. There's, you know, a different feeling. Sometimes you just learn things about people when you're there in person with them that maybe you didn't, you know, know or realize, you know, when you're talking with them on Zoom. So I think for leaders today, being comfortable with the technology that we have, first and foremost, to enable these kinds of connections and learn and understanding how to use it, you know, making sure that we're using it to the fullest extent possible, but then also keeping in mind that, you know, there is this human element that oftentimes 
gets pushed to the back or isn't even on the list. And, you know, one of the things that I would invite your listeners to think about is, you know, as a people leader or someone who's managing a team, are you actually leading people or are you leading productivity? Are you leading profitability, right? Are you leading process? Are you leading procedure? I so often see leaders that think they're leading people, but they're actually leading these other things. And you can't lead people like you lead projects and tasks. It's a completely different set of capabilities. Yeah, I agree 100%. And that's a great point. So based on that, doctor, uh, what what do you think feel creates value in today's organizations? I mean, has that shifted? And, and what does that look like now? You know, I talk about this a little bit in the book, um, Mr. Biz. So, you know, in the, in the past, you know, we often thought that like, it's the product and service that creates value in an organization, right? But really the thinking today and with human leadership, as I talk about in the book, is that the people create the value. If you don't have the people to execute the strategy or talk to the customers or sell the products, you don't have a business. So shifting that mindset from, you know, the product and service and focusing it on the people that are creating the value will help you gain some of those capabilities that you need to lead by putting people first. That's interesting. And I, I love, I love that. Um, so based on how things have changed and shifted so much in, in the, in the post COVID years, um, since we've been, I, it sounds strange to say years, it just, it just right? seems like it was, you know, <laughs> Three months ago, still, I don't, I don't know why it's yeah. the time is is stood still in some ways. But um, who do leaders really lead now? I mean, is it it? So it's obviously shifted. How how is that? How has it shifted in the, in your opinion? So you know, I think there's three main things that leaders need to lead. First and foremost, they need to lead themselves. You know, in contrast to what we often hear, leaders need to lead themselves first, and that is because if they don't lead themselves first, they can't expect anyone else to follow them. So they have to lead others, right? And when they lead themselves and they lead others effectively, then they're leading the business effectively. So those three domains I see are what had, needs to shift in this post-COVID era, right? We need to get better at leading ourselves. We need to get better at leading others. And we need to get better at leading the business. And when we look at technology and we look at AI, you know, the role of a leader is really shifting from that command and control, like we've talked about, right, prior to COVID and prior to 2018, um, to, you know, a coach and facilitator, you know, someone who helps people, you know, just like we were talking about earlier in our conversation, someone who helps people reach and exceed their potential, gain the capabilities that they need to perform at their best, and help the organization survive and drive those results. And so having that focus on the capabilities and being a coach and facilitator, and then also being the person who understands how technology works and helping people around you understand how to leverage that technology and use it to fuel and rocket boost your performance is also part of what leaders need to do today. Interesting. We've only got about a minute left here, but I, I wanted to I wanted to try to fit this in if we could. Um, um, what's So in the changing way that we work now and so many things are remote and everything, what's What's a way that leaders can quickly gain trust with, with their employees and folks that they have influence over? You know, in the past, we often thought trust has to be earned, right? And that is a very slow process, right? I don't know if anyone has ever listened to or read Stephen Covey's, you know, The Speed of Trust. But for human leaders in today, like, trust is given first. Why don't we trust someone? Why don't we just trust them automatically? Let's see how much quicker our results can be and how much stronger our relationships are when we just simply trust someone first and move from that position instead of distrusting someone and making them earn our trust. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. It's so many, so many things have changed. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, and I think it's only going to continue to evolve and, and head in that direction. Again, guys, we're talking this week with Dr. Jennifer Nash. You can find out more on our website, drjennifernash.com. You can check her out on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, X, Twitter. Um, and uh, look, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but um, any final thoughts? Any final thoughts on, uh, you know, being human and leading human? You know, I think in today's world, we have such an opportunity to change how we think about leadership and how we practice leadership. And if we can do that, we can make the world of work a better place for everyone. Love it. I love it. 
Well, thanks a lot for coming on, doctor. I uh, appreciate it. Um, guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a fantastic rest of your week. And don't forget, as always, cash flow is king. To become part of Mr. Biz Nation, follow him on all social media platforms or never miss a show by going to MrBizRadio.com. If you prefer free video content, visit the Mr. Biz YouTube channel or check out his streaming channel, which is available on 100 plus streaming platforms at MrBizNetwork.com.